This thing is used to clamp the disc to the spin drive so it won't fly away or whatever when spinning at high speeds. Now our PlayStation is prepared for game swapping. But before we burst into this, let me show you some things first. When we swap the game, we need to know which part of the digital PlayStation is actually reading at the moment. This is not as hard as it sounds, because you can actually see the laser through the surface of the disc. It's not that bright, so you most likely will need to turn your lights low. Also, it's a lot better visible on burnt discs with non-printed surfaces, but you should be able to see it on the original disc as well. So let's have a look at what the laser does when booting a game. It moves around a bit and then heads to the inner rings. This is where the copy protection code of the game discs is located. It's inside an area which DVD burners cannot write to, making it impossible to fake it on a burnt disc. Then it goes straight to some outer ring. This is where the boot file resides. Remember me talking about the LBA value in ISO Buster? The bigger the LBA, the farther outside the boot file is located. So this is what you get for about 750,000. The laser will move back and forth sometimes, reading the boot file and continuously checking back for the protection code. Basically, each time the laser moves to the inner ring, you have to insert the original disk so it can read the protection code. When it moves back outside, switch to the cockswap disk. Repeat this a couple of times and with a bit of luck you're gonna end up in the cockswap screen. Most probably you won't get it to work on the first try, at least I didn't. You either end up with a black screen, the browser appears, it's giving you these nice red blocks, or it just seems to ignore us and start up the game as usual. So when you try this, I really advise you not to use your favorite game. I tried a couple of other methods before I found this one to be working, and my FIFA game had to pay the price for it. See those nice scratches? That's what my lack of experience and countless swapping attempts did to it. These bastards are big enough to make the game unreadable. Now during the actual game swap, your worst enemy will be this plastic cover sort of thing, which just barely overlaps the pit the disc spins in. If you try to pull in the disc straight from the top, it most likely will get stuck at that stupid thing, keeping it from spinning. What I found out to work better is slide them in slightly from the side. I'm overdoing it here, just to show you. That's the way it's supposed to go. To take out the disc, grab under its back with two fingers and lift it up. Same time, gently press your thumb on the white plastic thing and slide it towards your fingers. It's kinda unavoidable to get fingerprints on the disc, so I suppose you clean them every once in a while. Alright then, let's go. Take the original game and the cock swap disc. Hook up all the wires if you haven't already done so. Don't forget the USB stick and memory card. Then power it on. Be aware of the usual safety stuff like don't look directly into the laser and so on. I'm sorry for the poor picture quality, but I had to turn the lights lower so I can see the laser and my camera sucks at everything that isn't bright as the freaking sun. Wait until the laser moves to the outer ring with the boot file. Then swap the discs. Notice that I stopped the disc for a short moment again after I inserted it. Only do this on the first swap. And then the boot file again. My gosh, Sony really must be paranoid. So when you finally start to get the hang of it, out of a sudden, it's over. The disc stops. Now take a look at your TV screen. If you see this, congratulations, you completed the difficult part. Press X on your controller and after some time, the golden disc turns into a purple one and the subtitle says use cock swap. Now we're gonna need the launch DVD. Take out your original game and put it in. Again, push X. The screen turns black for some time. And then this friendly grey screen greets us. It may look a bit ugly, but we won't be using it much. So you hit circle to go to the file browser. In the bottom line, it tells you which buttons do what stuff, in case you forget. Scroll down the list using the D-pad until you reach Mars. Then hit circle. This is the root of your USB drive, where we select freemacboot.elf and again hit circle. Another black screen awaits us. And then finally, the installer starts up. Before we start with the installation, let's first format the memory card. Go to the right to format MC and hit X. This will delete all memory card 1 content. Well, that's what it's supposed to do. Again hit X. Good boy. 
to start the installation, we'll be using the multi-version install. It allows us to use the exploited memory card on other PS2 systems. Note that this still is restricted to PlayStation of the same region, so my exploited European card won't work in American or Japanese PlayStation models. Push X again and it asks whether it really should do the multi-version install. Of course. And then off it goes. It will take quite some time, as memory cards are slow like hell. To explain in detail what exactly happens here is way beyond the scope of this tutorial. But to cut a long story short, it's similar to what we did with the hex editor earlier. It takes some legit file from the built-in PlayStation ROM, infects it with some foreign code and then writes it into the memory card in a special way, making the PlayStation think it's a software update, thus executing it at boot up. Well, thanks Sony for this nice update mechanism. After it finished the installation, take out the launch disk and reset the console. At first, you get nothing but a black screen. Then, the free Mac boot logo appears and eventually you'll end up in the browser. As you can see on the top, free Mac boot obviously installed alright. Just to make sure, I'm gonna plug the exploited memory card in my other PS2. Let's see what happens there. Nice. All that's left now is preparing our emulators or backup games. For this part we need some additional software, so open up your browser again, and I guess by now you already know where to go. Let's begin with the emulators. I want the Sega Genesis, NES and Super NES emulator. The Genesis one is called PGEN. Make sure to take the version with all that patches. Next is the NES, which goes by the name FCE Ultra. The newest version should be at the top. Last one is SNES 0.25. Since we are going to store our ROMs on a USB stick, we need the USB version. The emulator executables also go on the USB drive, so you might as well plug it in now. Extract the files you downloaded to our big junk folder. I suppose you name them, so you know which one is what later on. I just gonna name them Sega, NES and SNES. Then browse to your USB stick. I already put some game ROMs on there, so it's pretty full. But the emulators don't take up much space, about 4.1 megabyte combined. Create a folder called binaries or something like that and copy the renamed ELF files over there. I guess you could also just throw them in the root directory. What I'm going to do now is only necessary for the Genesis emulator, as far as I know. So if you're not intending to use it, you can skip it. To be able to read ROMs from the USB drive, the Genesis emulator needs two support files called usbd.irx and usbhdfse.irx. Very creative. Luckily, these files already exist on our USB stick in a subfolder of the free Mac boot installer. Go to Install and Modules. Copy both .irx files there and paste them into the binaries or wherever you call it folder. 